Welcome to the third season of That's So Second Millennium, the Catholic science podcast where we explore the fascinating borderlands between science and theology through realms of philosophy, human experience, and more. Welcome back to That's So Second Millennium. This is episode 109. This is a solo episode. It's just Paul at the helm today. It is actually a lot simpler to just sit down and record without even having to get a second person into the scheduling. There's at least that. I miss Bill. I would rather be talking to Bill, but uh, Bill is just swamped. He is teaching at Holy Cross this semester, and that means that he is caught up in the maelstrom of what are we doing in education this semester? We're going to have a whole semester of COVID. There's no way we'll get a vaccine working and change the situation in time not to lose a whole semester, lose a whole semester to COVID. But uh, yeah, that's the situation. So it's just me. So... Today I want to elaborate on, you know, of course the, the theme of that So Second Millennium is science and religion. So I'm going to talk about a science, psychology, and spirituality, which is part of religion, no matter what uh, many modern people try to say about it, using the term spirituality as a stick to beat religion with, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious, <sighs> because you've defined religion to be hypocrisy, but I don't think I'll get into that any further today. That's, that's, in case you haven't uh, discerned that from previous episodes, that's my take on that statement. Um, and I respect the people who have that belief, and I would like to have more conversations with them about that. But I think there is certainly a great deal of betrayed, hurt, adolescent, and the modern attitude about religion and so many other things. Anyway, but that's the, that's the loadout for this episode. So, I'm just going to go ahead and segue into talking about the crisis that we're in. So, of course, it's so easy for me. This is my personality. This is mostly my personality. You may, you may identify with it. You may not. But it seems like this whole, oh my gosh, I've heard people, you know, how many people I've heard say that we just, no one saw this coming. No one could have foreseen things happening like this, something like this happening. And, of course... At this point, I say to myself, well, yeah, okay, so a respiratory plague that's fairly easily transmitted and kills elderly people at an unacceptable rate, but, you know, isn't a direct threat to most of us, yeah, we could have foreseen that. But, of course, that is hindsight. That's partly hindsight. I mean, it is foreseeable. But it is, you know, of course, Bernard Lonergan, when he starts out his massive tome on insight, starts with the observation that once you've had an insight, it's impossible to unhave it. <laughs> and it's impossible to imagine the world. At least I find it impossible to remember how the world really was before I had those insights. I don't know. I don't know why I did anything when I was a teenager or 20-something anymore. I really don't. I just, I don't. Uh, the, the, the insights that racked up in my 30s. Yeah, I don't remember anymore. It's hard. I can't reconstruct that, those frames of mind. I, I, I just can't do it. I can get close. I mean, I can, I can do it partly. But I really can't succeed in constructing the whole fossilized uh, situation that I was in. So there is that. So And of course, the real problem with preparing is that there is a universe of possibilities. If you think about Gosh, we haven't thrown a bone to the physicists for a long time, so you physicists out there, if you think of Dirac's infinite sea of negative electrons, of positron, you know, positrons being more or less a hole in the negative sea of electrons, doesn't quite work out, but it does go a surprisingly long way in describing the physics. You think about that infinite sea of possibilities, all of the things that we couldn't possibly foresee and then, of course, there are the things that we could guess at, like, you know, a um, respiratory plague of moderately high transmissibility and moderate low, moderately low fatality, but it's still fatality. Um, of course, that was foreseeable in some sense, but it's part of this whole universe of possibilities. Even the ones that we could see are almost, you know, if, if, we, if we simply sat... If we took a thousand people 
and simply sat them down and had them build off of each other, you know, gave them breaks, um, <laughs> but gave them a year, you know, and then said, this is your job. And, and this is your job is to think of terrible things that could happen that the government of the United States or the countries of the world, the United Nations, various multi-billionaires could do something to prevent or do something to make less severe when it happens. I mean, how many possibilities would you come up with? And how many of them could you actually act as a fraction of those? How many of them could you actually act upon? Um, we can't know all the unknowns and we don't have, we don't have reliable scales to quantify them. We quantify them. We do our best I mean, of course, you know, having formal trading in data science now, I can say this with even more uh, certainty. You know, we we attribute numbers to things and we do our best, but we can't. We don't have any external scale to check those numbers. Or at least it's very difficult and therefore not done, as Chesterton would point out. Um, it's difficult and therefore not tried. And so we, we do the best that we can with the numeric models that we come up with and the possibilities that we can actually foresee to decide what to do in terms of the preparedness that we have. And preparedness is such a thankless job, especially for things like this that happen multi-decadally, you know. So, of course, our, you know, primary point of comparison is the Spanish flu. You know, there's the polio epidemic in the 50s. And what else? I mean, really, what else in the last century? Um add a few years, the long 20th century, if we're, uh, if you want to add that, if you want to call us that. So, yeah, I mean, we just, we just can't know all the unknowns. And so we, you know, so I guess to some extent we have to give each other grace. Um, we have, well, we might as well anyway, we don't have to, we don't have to do much. Um, we're, we're actually quite free to do a whole lot of things. Um, but we might as well, we would probably be better off if we recognize that. So what, gosh, you know, of course, so we th so, so let's look at, you know, how psychology and spirituality play out in some areas of modern life. So, of course, education. So I mentioned Bill. Obviously, Bill is dealing with teaching via technology, teaching with restrictions in place regarding, I'm not even sure, he's been so swamped he hasn't uh, kept me completely abreast exactly of... Uh, all the preparations. I know he was doing some remote teaching. He had a student who was quarantined, I believe. Um, yeah, so uh, so he's he's having to master the technology and um, and of course making preparations for the in many people's minds inevitable day in which we call off all in-person education again for a while because it simply you know the 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 number of case spreadings just goes too high and and people decide. To shut it down. So, so, and of course, education is sort of duly infamous for having, in the words of the great Dr. McCoy, the bureaucratic mentality, the one great universal constant. If you remember him at the end of Star Trek IV in their little shuttlecraft, finding out where they were going to be posted after the big uh, trial, after they've after they've saved the planet by transporting whales forward in the future. Yeah, that was a fun movie. Gosh, I watched that movie way too many times when I was a kid. Anyway, but uh, Dr. McCoy assures us that the bureaucratic mentality is the one great universal constant, and it will get a freighter. Because, after all, they've torqued the system. And, of course, they don't actually get a freighter. They get, you know, <laughs> because they had... <laughs> they still had models of the Enterprise in storage, so they got another Enterprise. Um That was just more fun. Or they just couldn't... They couldn't imagine having the franchise without it. So that would be that would be hysterical though an alternate history if they if they want to take these new reboots I would actually maybe finally get around to watching the reboots of Star Trek if I knew they were heading toward redoing <laughs> actually post the Captain Kirk to a freighter with bones and probably not Spock because Spock is too competent to get sucked up into that um, but you know uh, okay yeah there you go. Um, 
But the bureaucratic mentality, it is one of the great uh, human constants at any rate. And, of course, as I've commented before, the bureaucratic mentality I have in mind is the idea that we have enough information already, let's just start making decisions. And let's start telling people what to do based on what we already know, which is plenty. Um, yeah, it's the bureaucratic mentality. It's the engineering mentality to some extent, if I may be permitted to say so. I mean, there is a great fundamental tension between scientists and engineers, and particularly between geologists and engineers, I can comment on um, how that plays out in, in real life. But we do have different outlooks on the world. Uh, a scientist and doctors, I mean, you know, there's, there's a difference between research scientists, you know, people who are out to find new truths about the universe, and then what you might call well, I mean, professional scientists. So what do, what do I do as an environmental geologist? You know, I go out and I find out whether this particular gas station has benzene contamination in the groundwater. I'm going to dig a hole, I'm going to collect some samples, and I'm going to see if there's benzene. In fact, I'm going to dig several holes, and I'm going to take water levels and find out which direction the groundwater is flowing, and I'm going to attempt to come to an understanding. Now, of course, that's a different... There's clearly differences there between what I'm doing and what, say, Teese was doing when he was trying to put together the Teese equation, when he was conducting experiments to see if that actually worked in hydrology, for example. But there are an awful lot of similarities, too. I mean, of course, and in geology, or for that matter, in astronomy, uh, there is a lot of sort of middle ground. I mean, a lot of people who are professional... Professional? Professional scientists... Well, I mean, the, the, the distinction between a professional and an academic scientist, it's a continuum. It's like everything. I'm a mineralogist. Everything is a continuum. There's just... There are extremes, and we never even get to the extremes, but we know where they are. We know what direction they're in. So, you know, a professional scientist or an academic could both be looking at, it would just be, you know, if it, in, if it interests an academic, it's usually something larger and sometimes something that has less, fewer dollar signs attached to it, like going and finding out what specifically happened on the island of Kauai, how many calderas the island of Kauai actually has, how many volcanoes it actually has. That is a question of specifics. That's not a question of general principles. It's a question of finding out things about a specific locality. And in that sense, it's a lot more like what a geologist working for an environmental consulting firm is doing than, say, a chemist trying to find out what happens in general when you... Of course, a geochemist trying to find out what happens in general when you uh, melt mantle rock at such and such pressure and such and such temperature with such and such fluids uh, present. That's a general principle. That's something that could be applied to other planets anywhere in the universe that happen to have all those conditions together at the same time. Um, so education is in the hands of the bureaucrats. It's sort of by dint of having public education, we commit ourselves to that. We can't really help it. There is no other alternative once we have public ed education. Um, and public education is, you know, a good thing. Um, there are people who disagree with that, and I understand. I mean, of course, you know, there's a difference between thinking that public education is bad in principle and thinking that public education is bad in the form in which we currently have it, and I respect that difference. Um, not really here to talk about that right now. Um, but in a world where public education even exists, all other forms of education are going to get measured by those standards as well, so they're going to get sucked into the, um, they're going to get sucked into that mindset. And that's what we have. And so, of course, the worst thing about the bureaucratic mentality is not even thinking that we already know everything there is to know, but it's the making of gestures, regardless of whether they're even potentially, according to what we already know, going to be effective. <laughs> we probably all, uh, you know, could read the news about our local school, school districts, or for that matter, other large organizations, and identify situations where something is being done, some contamination, you know, some decontamination or contamination protection protocol is being engaged in and then thwarted the very next step. Another uh, conversation I've had recently, um, of course, with I've been talking to a lot of people, 
uh, more than I used to being in a job search. Um, the finance industry, um, not exactly where I want to go, but certainly a place that consumes uh, data scientists in fairly large quantities. Um, and so there's some, some people have uh, identified to me this sort of, um, you know, that from the inside of that industry, there's a lot of chaos right now and that they are reacting to a lack of information with a sort of, gosh, one term I heard used was bullwhip effect. And so uh, the, way they the way that was described to me was, you know, it's a chain of overreactions due to shocks, uh, due to lack of information, uh, due to changes in sort of an information flow from one group to another, and of course, you know, people financially dependent one, op one upon another. Um, and interestingly, they commented that the uh, sort of federal forgiveness of loans, to, you know, of, of, of indebtedness, of slowness on payments to the banks, and instructions to do likewise to others has, in a sense almost deprived them of information, which was interesting. Um, and that banks are now, you know, sort of looking around for other sources of information and making decisions to drastically curtail lending in somewhat arbitrary fashions, almost, um, due to their fear, due to, and due to some extent, to herd mentality. It sounded like, you know, they were, the <laughs> banks were looking at each other and if someone, it's, it's, it's a strange inversion of the, of the traditional run on the bank, right? Where some person stampedes to the bank, you know, runs to the bank, starts a stampede, uh, running, uh, making a run on one bank and then many banks, uh, assets. Now the banks are the ones stampeding. <laughs> um, and if one of them, uh, does something drastic to, uh, protect itself from risk, perhaps overprotect itself from risk, um, others are going to start following suit. And of course, some of this, you know, there, there's another um, aspect of the situation of like, there are people, you know, for all the people who are out of work, um, I'm sort of include myself, uh, there are other people who are overworked. And in particular, some of the people who are really overworked right now are the people in logistics. And as we all know, even if we don't all uh, act as if we know it, uh, the tireder you get, the worse decisions you make, and the less focus you have, for that matter. And so there's a lot of those people in finance, there's a lot of those people in logistics, and there's a lot of those people in a lot of uh, educational bureaucracies, too, I assume. I was interested and saddened and not really surprised to find out, you know, so of course, in the spring, we were reacting to things... You know, because it had sprung upon us. I mean, there was there were rumblings, but of course we've lived through, you know, in the 21st century, we've already lived through a couple of scares of, well, you know, the bird flu is going to come devour us all, MERS. Uh, and, you know, nothing happened in the United States. I don't think much happened in Europe. Uh, and so, of course, you know, the third time comes along and it's apparently the real deal this time. Yeah. Um, so we, so we were surprised, even if, you know, maybe we didn't have that much reason to be surprised, at least on the time scale of a couple of months. Um, it was visible to those who were willing to see that something like this could happen. But now we've had the whole summer. And so, so in March and April and May, we're just playing out the end of the 2019 to 2020 school year and whatnot based on, you know, okay, we're, we're in a crisis. We're just going to do the best we can. We had the summer to prepare. And I don't know that people did a whole lot of constructive preparation. Yeah, I, I, I was hoping for more of a sense of communication. And, you know, because the scientific enterprise works because it really is possible to come to consensus on things. <laughs> We're so... Eh, some of us intellectually in the modern world are so fixated on the idea that, you know... We really, you know, we're all different and we'll all disagree because we all have these random biases. And it can be drastically overstated. And uh, is often drastically overstated. Science would not work if it wasn't possible to come to some kind of um, consensus about an awful lot of things. 
even if it takes a while. So, you know, thinking about the, you know, so I've talked a bit about the psychology of things and the tendency that we have. You know, science is hard. You know, this is another side of the, the bureaucratic mentality. It is so natural to us. We have a hunger for information, and that was an interesting... I've listened to a couple of interesting audiobooks recently. One of them was um, it was about the science of distraction, and, and particularly... It was called The Distracted Mind? Was that all? There was a longer title than that. It includes The Distracted Mind. But it was a psychologist and a neuroscientist doing some very, I mean, it was, it was a very academically oriented book. It was, you know, dropping names of research laboratories and so forth, um, engaged in different pieces of research. So it was, it was a little bit thick to listen to, but it was still pretty, it was still quite intriguing. And one of their points was that, you know, in the, in the early, like, you know, why human beings do the things we do with technology heck, why we created them in the first place, and definitely why we consume them, um, why my little nieces spend so much time staring at a pad if they're allowed to, or watching media if they're allowed to, um, is, you know, we are, we are actually hungry for information, and that a lot of the behavioral science of focusing on animals, <laughs> an image and analogy that they used time and time again was actually a squirrel looking for nuts, and deciding, you know, having to make a decision when to abandon the tree that he's in and make the trek to another tree to look for more nuts because the pickings have grown so slim. And likening that to our foraging for information. And I think they literally use that term a number of times. Foraging for information. So we're looking for hits of information. I recognize myself. <laughs> Who do I recognize myself in that? I was, I was, I was foraging for information before it was cool, man. Um, gosh, yeah, you could have found me sitting in front of our, you know, 1985 edition of, like, Webster's Encyclopedia or something, um, just surfing, you know, I mean, it was, it was like Wikipedia before it was Wikipedia, because they have a C also at the bottom there, yeah, so that was, that was me, <laughs> picking up random books off the shelf for hits of information, uh, or reading the same book over and over again, but that's another story. Um, yeah, so that's uh, we do have a we, so we do have a quest for new information. That's how science came to exist at all. But we also have this really strong tendency to assume, you know, not at the same time, not in the same time, in the same way as Aristotle would say. It's not a direct contradiction. But we do also have in our compartments the ability to assume that we know everything already, and. And I think that compartment's pretty close to the compartment that, you know, feels like we have to control everything and that we have to, you know, yeah, I mean, the illusion of control. And that's a great, that's, you know, that, that, that crosses the line into the spiritual realm. The inability that we have, so many of us have, so much of the human race has to let things go when it's appropriate. Although on the other times, you know, on the other hand, of course, we have a tendency, you know, we also have the tendency, we can go either way. We can, we can fall away from the golden mean in either direction, either in the, in the direction of trying to control things. And when we do it, the same person does it in different areas. Um, we can try to control things too much, or we can abandon responsibility. And that, that mean, that, that middle is hard to hold. That middle is hard to hold, and that is, as, is, as in so many other things. So, I'll use myself as the final example here, the psychology and spirit, spirituality of being in a crisis. So, I am a job seeker, and this is facing me with, you know, I was just talking to my friend, um, just, just practicing sort of questions for interviews and things. So, of course, the, the infamous question, tell me about your greatest weakness. And so, what he uh, counseled me was uh, to, to have three, the, you know, the magical three uh, possibilities in my stable to answer that question, depending on the specific job and, you know, and how the interview is going uh, to, to use one of those three. And so I'd come up with two and then I came up with a third one. He didn't like the third one so much. I can see why he thinks the third one's probably kind of weak. <laughs> probably not the greatest uh, thing, perhaps. Uh, to bring up in a job interview, because of course, unfortunately, 
as much as I value the the uh, the areas of my life where I can be a little more candid in this podcast, I can be a little bit more candid than I can in a job interview. <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, I may not, you know, you know there, there, there are limits. So that the my number three uh, I'll probably shelf. But I thought of another one while I was uh, putting together my uh, brief notes for this episode, which is that I have an awful time, and I think even harder than the average human, which the average human, I think, has trouble with this. Um, but I have an awful time thinking statistically. And the way, and the, the specific problem there, all right, if you imagine little Paul, and Paul was never that little for his age. Um, I was always the tallest one in my class. But if you can imagine a shorter than six foot four Paul um, in fifth grade in the league, um, you know, I was terrible at batting and I was terrible at batting because I defeated myself before I got up to the plate because I knew that every individual trip to the plate was likely to be a failure. I was not likely to get on base. I was more likely than not, not to get on base. And that killed me. That literally killed me. Um, I can't em emphasize the degree to which that was a mental obstacle for me. Um, I'm doomed already. I'm doomed from the beginning. Why even try? And that that was still dogging me very much uh, still in graduate school. So my project in graduate school was looking for new uranium compounds. So I come up with a hypothesis, something that sounds likely, a hunch really, set of hunches, as many as I can come up with. And then I mix the... The, I mix the constituents of the hunch into this Teflon container, screw it into a steel container, and put it in an oven, and the temperature of the oven and the time at which I leave it there are also elements that I have to have hunches about, and see if anything new <laughs> grows out of it. And who even knows what the odds are, but they're less than 50%, I tell you that. So... That's, that was difficult. Um, I did manage to finish my PhD, thank God. I got out in four years. Um, but it didn't, that didn't help me. That didn't help me at all. Uh, that, that did not help me do my best work uh, in that situation. And I knew people who did not have nearly as much trouble with that, who did better work and put out more results and more interesting results than I did. Um, yeah, so that's a problem, Th thinking statistically. And, of course, now I'm in a job search, and, of course, every job application, even warm job applications where I'm making, you know, that's an effort to do this weird networking thing. Um, yeah, I, which, you know, I, I've, I've fortunately somewhere along the line in the not-too-distant past, really sometime during my boot camp, um, someone proposed it to me, I'm just trying to get to know interesting people, people who are interested in working in areas that I'm interested in working in. That helps me a little bit. Helps me a little bit. Um, it gives me something to look forward to that has a higher rate of success <laughs> than, and, and somehow or another, you know, and after a long convoluted series of events, I could actually get a paying job out of this. Um, because of course that odds, the odds on that are very much less than 50% on all of these, all of these. So after making sure to, uh, haul myself into it, you know, so that's both, you know, so that's the psychology of it. And that's also, of course, you know, there's a spirituality to it. Hope is a difficult, difficult virtue for me. And it is a virtue. Um, I listened to, I was a founding listener, as I, in fact, to uh, the Don't Keep Your Day Job podcast. Um, I listened to, I think I listened to it religiously for probably over two years. Um, it got to be a little repetitive, and I got to realize that I'm not actually quite her target audience. But if any of you are creatives, if you are entrepreneurial types, it might be right up your alley. It's certainly a good podcast. Um, and Kathy Heller is a person that I <laughs> spiritually and otherwise sympathize a lot with because she's been through, she's been through heck. Um, and I recognize her kind of heck in certain ways. Um, my, my childhood was nowhere as difficult as hers, but yeah, um, recognizing that. So, so she started the podcast and she said a number of times, 
hope is not a strategy. And that's true. Hope is not a strategy per se. But someone came on, I want to say within, certainly within the first period, let's just say that. Um, and who, you know, and who convinced her a little bit otherwise, because hope is also a necessity. Um, if you're going to actually take any action and <laughs> this is a, this is a line that I had a character say in, uh, the manuscript of a novel that I have, uh, sitting on the uh, hard drive somewhere. But, uh, yeah, Bob, the, uh, Bob, the old, uh, geologist says, that hope is a virtue, um, and you don't get much done without it. It's so, so many ways, some of the, there are certain characters in my novels that I find are really, uh, I'm sort of projecting people that I wish I had in my life, or at least, you know, some elements of my personality that uh, I would like to be more in the forefront. Um, that we, I'd probably be better off if we're more in the forefront. Sometimes those come through. So, yeah, psychology and spirituality of dealing with crises. Um, our needs for control, our psychological desire for control of situations we really can't control. Um, our desire to pretend like we already know the answer when we really, really don't, and we really can't. And, you know, and the difficulty of, you know, facing... Facing a situation like trying to find work today in the United States when it's so much harder than it was. But that just means that the odds are lower, and that means you need more shots on goal before you get that goal. Um, it just makes it harder. It doesn't make it impossible. But that difference between harder and impossible... Yeah, sometimes some, some of us uh, can, can lose track of that very readily. All right. Well, that's our episode. So hopefully Bill and I will be back in a couple of weeks. And hopefully there's good news on the COVID front and many other fronts. So we'll be praying for you. We're grateful for your um, continued listening. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of That's So Second Millennium. TSSM's audio producer is Morgan Burkhardt. Our theme music, Igneous Grok, was composed and performed by Ben Marquardt. For my co-host Bill Schmidt, I'm Paul Geesting. Until next time.